All right. Hello, everybody. This is Andrew Hunziker, CPA, founder of Dope CFO. Today, we have a super exciting guest. Um, I can't wait to introduce. Um, Sean Yoder has been a member of, of Dope CFO VIP community, as well as our Dope CFO Mastermind for quite some time. We've gotten to be friends and known each other. We've been to at least two events together and dinners and we've had an absolute um, ball um, getting to know each other which is has been a huge um, goal of mine as as dope CFO grows to get deep relationships with with some of the people in the program which which we have been able to do um, this one we're going to talk about a lot but we're gonna we're definitely going to hit the theme of anxiety on this one um Sean has talked publicly about his anxiety I'm gonna let him dive into to that post you just mentioned um I brought it up as well I've had anxiety I think my entire life and I'm 59. Um, I'm doing, I saw a naturopath yesterday. I've been actually actively working on, on things to help reduce mine. I, I have this hunch that many, many accountants have anxiety. And so it's a great topic um, because in this related to what we do in Dope CFO, we, we're getting out there and active in the industry and meeting people. We're not just hiding in our closet. And so it's a, it's an important issue, but let me turn it over Um First, I want to get, get let's get into your accounting background and other background. You've got more than three decades of accounting experience with a very heavy compliance first focus. You founded your own firm in 2017, built your reputation around calming accounting chaos, <laughs> creating financial order and properly reducing tax liability. So that is all awesome. And then your subsequent move to serving cannabis is a nat natural evolution from his years of experience in compliance heavy industries, as well as living in the Emerald Triangle and being kind of an OG. So, so why don't you start with your background because it's definitely a super interesting story um, just to go back as far as you want to even getting into accounting. Sure, absolutely. Um, I have been doing uh, accounting uh, since 1991 and uh, I started on QuickBooks in 1991. Uh, and that was simply because my parents were well aware that prior to that, that I was already in the weed game. I was already selling. I started selling when I was about 15. Uh, then that was a way that I made money. And so I've always been an entrepreneur as far back in my life as I can remember, always hustling to make money and, and selling weed was a great way to do that. And so my parents, they didn't, they saw a very dangerous path ahead for me. So they decided that it was really important to teach me a trade. So my parents owned a contracting, an HVAC business, and they needed accounting help. So when I was 16 years old, they pulled me in and they taught me all about accounting. And so ever since then, I've been doing accounting at, at various stages of my life. And that's it's always something that's interested in me. The, the minute my mom taught me how to do accounting, I was I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. And honestly, I think it, it's one of the things that having been so heavily involved in illegal enterprise in cannabis for so long, it's one of the things that helped to keep me out of jail, to be honest with you. And so I'm really, really thankful that my parents taught me accounting. And it's honestly, it's become extremely lucrative for me. Uh, you know, I've worked for a lot of terrible firms out there. I learned everything, how to do everything wrong. <laughs> and in the process, I decided that I can do this better. And so when I started my own practice in 2017, I immediately had clients. I've been making money ever since then. I quickly switched from bookkeeping to the CFO model where you really, really take care of the client and you do everything for them because that's really what they want. They don't want you to go, oh, we're going to do AP function. We're going to do accounts receivable for your collections. They want you to do everything so that they don't have to worry about it. And so connecting with Dope CFO and with you, Andrew, has been, a, you know, it's been <laughs> really a cul culmination of well, all of that sort of a logical conclusion. It's like you, you encourage that. Well, and and maybe too, before we dive into kind of how you found Dope CFO and got involved in our program, even as one neat thing about kind of Dope CFO and accounting, I think it draws a lot of accountings in. It's a cool, fun industry with a real mission, but you, you've been around the industry as well, living in the California as well as a music industry. You have a pretty deep music background too on the side. Yes, I do. I, I lived in Los Angeles for a long time in, in Southern California, and I worked in the music industry. I worked with uh, essentially selling music. That was what I was really, really good at. But in the process of doing that, you know, I've always been about building relationships. So I built relationships with, honestly, with a lot of 
sort of famous people in the music industry and learned a lot about how to run a business, how to run a lean business. And one of the, the key things that I learned uh, from one of my bosses is that in order to run a successful enterprise, you have to understand every aspect of your enterprise, including all the way down to like how to clean the toilets in, in your place. <laughs> and that's how you're successful. And so that was a really, really big deal from for me, but also the music industry and the cannabis industry go hand in hand. Nobody was making any money in the music industry, especially on the independent music side. So going on tour was a lot of trafficking weed across the country too. And so I learned a lot about both of those things and they've both been super fascinating to me. And I still continue to be very connected uh, as a DJ uh, to the music industry uh, to this day. And it's sort of still a side hustle of mine that I make a little money at and still enjoy doing. Well, that's awesome. And and then why don't you evolve into how you kind of came a, a, around Dope CFO and just picking that niche in general. It, it definitely is a fun niche. It has some color to it for sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that was one of those things where I've, I've been wanting to do this and sort of solicited my services out there to the universe, you know, through social media. And a an accounting firm out of Southern Oregon found me and said, hey, can you do a cleanup for us? And so I'm going to give you the specifics of what happened in that cleanup is that what we see a lot in this industry is, is that the client uh, was, was a dispensary had lost their bank account. So the account, the, the accounting person, they were friends. And so she said, you can use my bank account. And oh, so there God. was a commingling co- 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 of funds there. And so then the dispensary, you know, it it definitely put a strain on their friendship because the dispensary owner said, well, what's yours and what's mine? And so I was called in to do an audit to figure out. And it turned out that the the account, the accounting firm owner had used about eight thousand dollars in funds of the dispensary for her own personal, Uh uh, you know. And so I'm like, well, first off, this looks like money laundering. And second of all, I'm like, it's going to put a huge strain on your friendship. And third, why are you doing this? And, and, you know, she kind of explained to me and just, and this was before I knew anything about 280E because they weren't doing, they weren't, they weren't accounting for that. There wasn't any cost accounting going on. It was just literally bookkeeping. And I'm like, this is a disaster. And I know that this cannot be right. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a Google search. Who's going to train me how to do this right? Because it seems... Like this is the right amount of challenge that I want in my career uh, because yeah. accounting can get really, really boring and mechanical. And I think a lot of accountants really hate doing what they're doing because it's just so it's the same day after day. And I'm like, well, this seems like an industry that's got a lot of challenges in it. Yeah. And, and so when I looked up, I found Dope CFO and I'm like, oh, this is how you get trained. And that's when I learned about 280E. And I'm like, I can guarantee nobody's addressing this. I can almost guarantee yeah. that. And that was that was it. I, I reached out to you, and you you gave me a screaming deal I couldn't ignore, and I joined the program, and it's been it's been life changing for me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Well, and it's been super fun to get to know you and and watch you progress and become super successful, and then either even mentoring others in the program and and people reaching out to you and about. Um, I love how. What did you say? You tell where they reach out asking you for the secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the secret, the secret formula to marketing yourself, which, you know, I tell people there's no secret formula. Uh, and I think some of the people in, in the group are starting to figure that out. It's hard work. You really have to, like, get yourself out there and get outside of your comfort zone, which for somebody like me who's got a lot of anxiety, it's a real challenge. Well, and I think that maybe hits the nail on the head because the people I've talked to in the program and out without so many people, well, I know a lot of them have anxiety. So many people just say, maybe say the nicer word, well, oh, I'm an introvert. <laughs> or like, I get that a lot. I hate marketing. And then people get in the program and then they say, we say, oh yeah, we'll get involved in the industry. It's fun. But I think there are still people in our program even that are just like, no, I'm going to send cold emails on LinkedIn because I can do that hiding in my bedroom. And so they they struggle. They even when they come in their program, they they still don't want to go out and join these groups or whatnot. So this is kind of maybe a, a relate relate into the anxiety side of of cannabis, and really is a great topic. How do we overcome that introvertedness or anxiety? And maybe kind of start with your background dealing with anxiety, and maybe even what point did you know that that you had anxiety? You know, it's been something that I've thought about my whole life. I think it's something that I was born with, and that's something I'm currently working through in therapy that I think my therapist has correctly identified that I'm neurodivergent. 
which is not something that people want to talk about, like being on the on the spectrum of being autistic, uh, which is fine. I'm really I'm really coming to terms with that now as I'm approaching 50, that maybe that I was born a little bit different. And I'm totally fine with that now. But I don't think that's something that people really want to talk about. But it's something that's really affected me in my whole life. I've always felt like I've been kind of an outsider. And it's really kind of pushed me and made me feel really lonely. So I I really suffered through a lot of substance abuse. And mostly for me, it was alcohol. And I really tried to drown all of that anxiety and alcohol. And what I discovered over time is that alcohol doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. In fact, it, what it does is it slowly kills you. And I've definitely seen several of my friends over the past few years die from their alcohol abuse. And so that was a big wake up call for me in terms of like, and the only medicine that I've been on, and I've been on everything that you can think of in terms of medication to deal with anxiety. And the only thing that actually really, really works is a mixture of cannabis and St. John's work. And that's it. And that, yeah. and that, that keeps me going. And so, you know, and I think a lot of people I've met in the cannabis industry are in the industry because they have health issues and cannabis is a medicine for them. And I realized that, and I was just recently talking with a client, he said, it's not rec or medical for him. It was, it was both. It was an and. It was it was rec and medical, and I feel the same way. I use cannabis recreationally on the weekends to enjoy myself, but I also use it on a daily basis to keep me able to function and work the long hours that are required to be, you know, to to run a run your own practice. And, and that is a great point, just about the industry as a whole. The last poll I saw, ninety two percent of Americans want access to medical cannabis because it treats so many ailments that are biggies, including anxiety or depression or pain or whatever. It is real medicine. But but getting involved in this industry, you know, I think that helps whatever you have. If you're involved in an industry that you believe is really changing the world and making the world a better place, it just makes it easier to get up and go to work in the morning, um, whatever your ailments. And so that's um, a really good point on that side um, and dealing with it with the day in and day out, both the medical and the rec. How do you this would be more on the day to day side. How do you manage it while you're pitching potential clients? That can always be a very scary one. You're talking to a CEO or whatever. You know, I get really nervous. Like I'm nervous right now. And one of the things that I really work on and I've been working on for the past 25 years is meditation. Meditation and being sitting and being calm and still is a really, really big part of my daily routine. Uh, and that's really, and so I have, what I have, uh, it's called, and I, and I learned this from a Buddhist monk when I was in a moment of crisis, there was, there was a meditation center in my neighborhood when I lived in Los Angeles. And I, I came in there one time when I was drunk as a skunk and I was like, you guys got to help me. And the <laughs> monk pulled me aside and said, here's a simple technique that'll get you through life. And he's like, you got to concentrate on five deep breaths, really like as much until your lungs hurt. And he's like, at the same time, you have to, you know, he essentially taught me the Zen method of staring at the wall until the wall disappears. And so, and it took me a long time. It took me about 10 years. I, I had no idea what he was talking about until I, saw <laughs> the, until I was staring at my walls one day and the walls disappeared. And I sort of get this 10,000 foot overview of my life and existence. And I can kind of see outside of myself. And as soon as I can see outside of myself, nothing really matters anymore. I'm like, so what if I get sweaty palms and I stammer with a call and I don't know all the answers? Like, who really cares? Like, do they, does, does the person in the, you know, in the meeting care? Not unless, you know, I start insulting them or something like that, or, you know, really make it personal. Uh, they don't really care. All they're really trying to do is figure out whether I'm the right fit for them. And so it, it really taking that perspective of, if, am I adding value to their life? And, you know, and realizing that I have my own issues, but that that's okay. Like we all have our own issues and I'm sure that the, uh, the person I'm speaking to has their own issues in life and just sort of minimizing things and realizing that existence is bigger than what I can see with my own eyes. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. I love the story about the monks as well. So say you're kind of conversely to having a conversation, say it's just, you've got a huge workload and it's just almost like anxiety can almost shut you down where you're just like, Oh, I want to procrastinate or, or not even get started. Um, as it all, often can be in the accounting profession. You know, I, it really is a challenge. And, and that's a, 
And I struggle with that. I think everybody struggles with their workload in, in this industry. And, you know, that's where more cannabis definitely comes into play with, for the late nights to, you know, once I'm not having to talk on the phone, I don't exactly like to use cannabis when I'm like having <laughs> meetings with people. But when I've got to pull late hours, because, you know, here's the ultimate thing is, is that the reason I think we're all doing this, and I think you really harp on this, Andrew, very well, and I think you've got it all drilled into our heads pretty well, is, is that you've got to offer white glove service to your clients. And the only way you can offer white glove service to your clients is if you care about them. And so sometimes you got to, even though you've got anxiety and, and you want to procrastinate, you have to do right by the client. And, and, and it's easier for me now. And one of the things that's been really a big deal for me is developing a, a very close, almost personal relationship. My clients that I deal with are like family. And so you don't want to let them down. It's like letting down, you know, Aunt Joan. Yeah. You don't want to do that. And, and it's not, you know, and I know my clients are not going to blow, you know, give me a lot of blowback if I, if I'm not timely, but I'm like, but I care about, you know, my, you know, that, that sort of relationship. And that's more important to me uh, than my anxiety, than my workload and things like that is offering that white glove service and not just because I have to, but because I want to. And that's, that's a big deal. Well, and, and related to that, and I know I've heard you talk on this too. One nice thing about being a dope CFO and having clients as opposed to a job, you may have a job and get not love your boss or the mission, but having being in the movement, really be believing in the movement, um, doing good thing, and then having clients and being able to pick your clients. So if, if you don't feel like you have that love or connection with that that client, you can hire a different client. They're not just hiring you. So you you really need because if you can make those just like you're saying these little shifts of perception that um, that can really serve you well, like, oh, I'm looking at you all like family, that I'm helping you, that I'm not tricking you to hire me so I can get a bunch of money. I'm actually going to make your company better by doing good accounting and all that as well. Um, but the... Um, try, I'm losing my train of thought where you, you had mentioned about being very picky about even the people you work with. Yes, I'm extremely picky about the people that I work with. And and I learned that part of that I learned in the Dope CFO program, because I also serve non canon clients too. And one of the things that you you said is, is that the clients that are underperforming, you know, they don't pay you enough money or they give you a lot. It it takes a lot to deal with them. They're, you know, you deal with strong personalities anytime you're dealing with, with businesses. So if if there's a client that I don't get along with, well, they're on the short list of clients that I'm going to get rid of. Like I only want to work with clients that want to work with me. And so Every single one of my clients that I have now, whether it's in Canada or non canna they all say the same thing. I respect you. I trust you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I appreciate you. That's all I hear from my clients. And yeah, we have issues. It's not all peaches and cream all the time. <laughs> but for the most part, and that, and I feel the same way. So anytime a client says that to me, I respect you. I appreciate you. I say the same, same thing back to them as well. I respect you and I appreciate you as well. And if we keep that two-way street going on. And so I'm super picky. If a client sends me red flags during a discovery call or a lead sends me, you know, red flags during a discovery call, I'm going to pass on them. And they're usually mystified by that, but it's just like, and I'll explain <laughs> to them why. It's like, I know that we're going to have problems down the road and rather than, take on this engagement. And then 90 days from now, we find out that we don't really get along and that I, you have to go find somebody else. It's like, why don't you just find that somebody else now that's going to work with you? Because not mm -hmm. everybody's a good fit. Not And and somebody else I might be able to serve a, that client better. A great point. And once you start to build that confidence and you're really happy with the product you can deliver and you're going to use that white glove service and you're, you're doing all these things. You can be confident that, Hey, I'm doing, I'm at the top. I'm doing what nine out of 10 accountants and bookkeepers are not doing. And so I'm going to be confident. I'm going to look for the right client that wants this world-class service. Um, and then kind of related to that in the anxiety side or whatever it is, we talk about, we are the asset of our business, basically. So we're investing time and money in ourselves to always get better. So maybe it's more accounting knowledge or more cannabis knowledge or or more marketing knowledge or whatever it is to keep growing our business and ourselves, and always looking at what, what our weakness is or what our issue is. And so, for example, anxiety has been something I've been focused on a little bit this year. I've been out to a naturopath two times. She gave me... I mean, there's all kinds of little tricks like like or not even tricks or hacks or quick things like the the breathing exercises or or whatever. But she gave me a simple one because I like coffee. She's like, Andrew, um, get a little protein in your body in the morning before you start coffee. 
And just like that, it just like smoothed me out a little bit. I was getting up and having one or two coffees and just all of a sudden I'm just like jittery. <laughs> um, yeah. And so and you know what? I <laughs> used that hack too. When you said that, when you mentioned that to the group, that that's what you were doing to deal with your anxiety. I, I went ahead and I said, what's the worst that can happen? I have a little meal in the morning. I normally don't have a meal in the morning at all. That's I don't how I was. <laughs> And so, but I don't have coffee either because I'm allergic to caffeine. And so for me, it's meditation in the morning. And, but I still find like a lot of people in this industry, you're up first thing in the morning. And when, as soon as your eyes open, you're worried about what's going to happen during the day and you're checking your phone to see what's going on. You're checking your calendar, all those kinds of things. But boy, that gets the anxiety way up there really, really fast. And so well, by using that hack that you gave us, I'm like, it's helping me. It honestly is helping to lower some of that anxiety. So I appreciate you sharing some best practices <laughs> there. Well, us. and 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 yeah we're all since we're all in it together like it's yeah i'm 59 and you start looking well the statistics say i've got 20 years left if i'm average and so i don't want to spend 20 years of being anxious and so i'll do all these these little things or big things or whatever and another one i think we all hear this and we know it so there's there's this dual thing like i want to role model everything for the students and most people tell me i'm available i answer posts quickly in facebook i'm on calls i answer emails i'm pretty responsive but the other hand i'm trying to switch a little to where like instagram for example if i can just force myself to one or two times a day because it's real easy to just start scrolling around twitter's the same way i get on it once a day Facebook, I'm trying to just block it because otherwise I just, I think we all realize this. You start scrolling and it just makes your anxiety go up. You're whatever, you may not even be cognizant. You're scrolling through and Sally's successful. Why am I not? Or whatever. Um, it can just, and so like there's there's pros and cons of some people like, I hate Facebook. It's like, well, one great thing of Facebook is we can make a community, which we have. That's the only thing I like at all on Facebook is our private community <laughs> that we have and we can connect with each other. But like Instagram is a good place to be because a lot of cannabis people are there. But on the other hand, you could just scroll till, till you're... <laughs> All day long, it will never end. And so it's just, you got to be be careful to take breaks from those things. You really uh, do. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I went through a period where, oh, during COVID, where I was completely off social media. Uh, the only thing I was involved in was the Dope CFO VIP group. And that was about it. I was avoiding all social media entirely. And uh, I don't think that that was necessarily beneficial for me because I felt extremely disconnected at that point. <laughs> uh, but then I also noticed when, once I came back onto social media that I was doing a lot of that just scrolling. And then I found when it was time to work that I was unable to work and I couldn't quite figure out, I couldn't make that connection. And I was like, oh, my anxiety is really up. And so whenever my anxiety is really up, I can't really do much of anything. And so it's like, okay, back to meditation. And so I've had to do the same thing. I've had to do the like, let's limit the amount of time that I spend on social media because it's helpful, but too much of it is a bad thing. It has to be done in moderation. And especially if you're an accountant and you're doing some actual work, if you get pinged or dinged on emails or chat or text messages or whatever, it is so hard. And they've proven that a hundred times over. Like if you're going back and forth and back and forth, it just is not the effective way to, to work. Do you have any other tips on, um, we've really dove in deep into this anxiety, dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, out, I mean, anything from just being part of a community or whatever. Yeah. Being part of a community, being honest with yourself, I think first and foremost, like, I think a lot of people want to ignore the fact that, you know, it, because it's an embarrassing situation, although most people do suffer from anxiety. I think it's an embarrassing situation because it makes you act oddly. I've definitely had situations where, you know, I couldn't leave my house. I couldn't leave a hotel room, even though I was at a business conference. Those kinds of things have happened to me in my life. And it's embarrassing. So being more honest with yourself about like what your limitations are and really try to take care of yourself, but also sharing it. And so that's one of the big things for me. And I guess it's maybe a little annoying, but I'm OK with that. I'm OK with being a little annoying. Being honest with others, like sometimes my behavior might be a little off and it's not because I'm some sort of weirdo or I don't like you or something. It's like I'm going through my own things. And as soon as you tell people that you are you have an illness, like most people have an illness. So that's it's, it's instantly something that people can relate to. And so that's been a really, really big deal for me is to be a lot more open and vulnerable about this kind of stuff. And 
a little nervous about doing that, but getting so much in return from others. We're saying, hey, I'm suffering with the same thing. Can we like talk with each other about this? And then when I could talk with someone else and like tell them what I do and maybe help them out of a situation or maybe they can help me out of a situation, like that's been really huge for me. And and by the way, the you brought up, you've been super authentic on LinkedIn, on Facebook or wherever, and just being real with your issues. So many in the cannabis industries that, that are pushing the movement, the CEOs, the investors, they've dealt with issues and that's how they found cannabis and they believe in it. So they're maybe in the, in the non-cannabis world, if you're an accountant, you put up your LinkedIn, you got your coat and tie on and it's the pretend, the resume face and, oh, I'm a yep. superstar and I got straight A's and all this stuff. Cannabis, that actually might backfire on you. It's better to just say, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect. <laughs> I've, I've got issues and problems, but I'm a real person. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Andrew. That's an excellent insight uh, there. I think that this industry is a lot different. And I think people who are accountants who come from that background, and I think we all come from that background of like, what me worry, you know, and you got to be sort of stone faced about everything uh, to an industry where it's okay to be a lot more open about things. I think a lot of people who from who come from accounting struggle with that. And so it's been a big change for me to be a lot more authentic. But honestly, I'm finding it easier to run teams to do work when you're a lot more authentic and you have real conversations uh, with people about things. And basically, like I just had a meeting with a team yesterday that, that I'm leading and basically said to them, it's like, you know, they were like, oh, I feel like we're getting off topic here. Somebody was talking about their family. And I said, no, actually, we're not because we're human beings first and foremost. That's who we are first and foremost. I said, there's plenty of time to talk about work and get the work done. But I'm like, we have to talk about what's bothering you first, because that's going to be a, an impedance to you getting the work done. So let's let's get that off your chest. And so let's go from there. And so having that sort of level of humanness is a big deal. <laughs> and that's and by the way, that's a big part of our mastermind program is we encourage each other, hold each other accountable, be the community, help each other because it's it's helping me as well. And it kind of inspired me because I'd been dealing with anxiety, you know, what whatever I read, TikTok, um, can't ever say his name right, Tik Tcon or whatever, read yeah. some of this stuff. But this year I actually got off my butt. I knew this lady from rock climbing community. It's like, I'm gonna go to the naturopath. And we did, she did these massive blood studies on me, and she found out that I'm intolerant or she thinks I am to dairy. And so now we're I've eaten cheese and milk and cream my whole life. And so I'm taking a break off that. See if that helps. So I encourage you people to, there's so many different ways we can read books or talk to each other, or watch this podcast or go to the, the naturopath. And um, just, if that's you do try to do something and get each other to, to encourage each other. Cause I know we all build each other up really as a community. We do. And that's a big part. It's one of the biggest things that has been a, so important to me and why I work such long hours. I work 90 hour weeks pretty regularly. <laughs> and one of the reasons that I do is because I, I'm so passionate about the cannabis community. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about with all my years of being in the in the illegal market uh, or, you know, what they call the legacy market mm -hmm. is that a lot of my friends have been been to prison. A lot of my friends have been murdered. And it's it's really sad, uh, that part of it. And so like expungement is a big thing that I'm really passionate. It doesn't really have anything to do with accounting other than I see the bigger picture. It's like we lost a lot of good people to prison in this industry that could really offer a lot to this industry. So I work with organizations like uh, uh, cannabis, cannabis Equity Employment and stuff like that to really work on this expungement and get people back into the industry. Uh, you know, we need as many bright minds in this industry as we can. And so that's really <laughs> being part of a community like that to encourage others to get, you know, to, to work through the stigma of cannabis and to really like do something about this. Cause this is a great yeah. industry. This and, and that's yet another great point. We talk around our VIP in the program of getting involved and immersing. And part of that is giving back. And, and that's another way around anxiety is if you're scared to talk to the CEO, but but you get involved in mentoring or giving back or helping getting involved in expungement or criminal justice or whatever, you're helping out. And then you it's easier role. Think, oh, I'm just mentoring somebody. I'm helping them. Um, and then you're meeting others in the industry. So that's yet a, another way um, to just um, to get around that, that anxiety thing. Because all of us can usually think, oh, I can volunteer is different yeah. from um, selling some, something to somebody. <laughs> 
It, it is. It's a lot different. And, you know, here's what I've noticed is that, you know, everybody, including myself, started out like, who do I reach out to? Like, you know, and you'd have to do that cold calling process. Well, the cold calling process in this particular industry is very, very difficult because nobody knows who you are and they don't trust mm -hmm. you. And, and this culture doesn't necessarily accept people that they don't trust. As soon as you get involved in like helping and mentoring and really getting out there and building that goodwill within the industry, you don't have to go out and look for those CEOs. You get introduced to them because somebody's like, I really appreciate what you did for me right there or my organization right there. Thank you. Let me in. Who are you? Who do you want to talk to? And then you say, hey, I'm looking for CEOs and need, you know, these services, or can, you know, accounting services, uh, you know, especially uh, full full service accounting services and you get those introductions from people and those are very warm leads because those are people who are generally friends and you know of, of the person that's introducing you and so you get a very warm lead of sort of like who a friend of a fr you know of a friend is a friend of mine and so that's really how i built up my pipeline it's just doing all that that outreach and goodwill work well and and that's a, a good note to kind of get towards close so any um, final advice for accountants thinking about getting in the industry, but also um, where people can find you. I highly recommend if you're a Canna owner or CBD owner, get in touch with Sean. Um, I think you're doing amazing work. You're passionate about the industry, super knowledgeable. Um, the people like you that are in, in the program that are really going all into cannabis, this isn't like one out of 10 industries you serve or whatever, and you kind of know what's going on. Like you're all in and I think the owners appreciate that. We will have on their show notes where to find you and all that as well. But but if someone's just in their car listening to YouTube or whatever and they want to find you quickly, what are what are some easy ways to find you? Uh, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn. That's uh, where I'm most active. So you just look up Sean Yoder on, on LinkedIn. You'll find me. I'm usually saying I usually have some pithy comments about <laughs> things about the industry because I don't like everything about this industry. And so I'll definitely have some opinions about things. And you can find me on my website, which is aldertinegroup.com. Uh, and, and, you know, that's that's my website out there. And you can definitely find me. And I, I'm definitely getting leads from my website. So if you're hearing this and you want to talk to me, like go to my website and just fill out a submission form and we'll be in touch with each other. And in terms of people wanting to get into this industry, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, and I don't think I need to say anything more than that. You have to be committed to this. You have to be all in. This isn't something that you can just dab your toe into and make a little money out as a side hustle. Cannabis requires a full commitment. The plant requires a full commitment to it. <laughs> and so if you're not willing to make that commitment, then you probably you know, this probably isn't the industry for you. And the, and the side benefit, we get to go have fun, fun little um, get togethers at events. <laughs> and oh, um, yeah, it can at the dental conventions. They're probably not as fun as the after parties and whatnot. And and you can find your own group like me and the people that go to bed early and then the people that will stay up all night with you. Um, so we will <laughs> definitely have all of your stuff up on our, our show notes and links. Um, so that, so you all can find Sean via dope CFO as well. Um, this has been, I'm sure this is going to be a biggie um, topic and we'll post on different social media because like you said, I think you posted this on something about this on LinkedIn and it went pretty much viral. Um, yes. So many people deal with this. Yeah, I, they really do. And, and I got so much outreach from people saying that, that this is something that I'm dealing with in my life. I appreciate your honesty. Most people don't want to talk about the the way that they were trying to medicate themselves for years and years and years. And I'm like, I'm not afraid to talk about that stuff anymore because all that stuff is in my past now. And all I see is a really, really bright future where I can, where I'm in partnership with my anxiety rather than my anxiety is in control of me. No, great point. And um, yeah, I'm a big, big passion of the plant. And really my background too, had a lot of alcohol when my teenage years and college years, not even really putting a label on anxiety. I was just like, oh, it feels better to be really drunk. <laughs> yeah. Um, but where where cannabis, like you say, like even I have, I use a tincture of, and it's super mild, but it takes the edge off. And um, it's not like drinking a 12 pack. <laughs> um, it, it never is. And that's the wonderful thing about it. It's one of the reasons why I really like can of beverages a lot. It's, it leans into that, like, I still like drinking, but I don't feel like I'm drinking and that's a big deal, you know, and I think that uh, this industry is in the plan is going to offer a lot to people. I think it's really going to cut through a lot of substance abuse problems, which are related to anxiety because so many people suffer from it. 
Well, this has been an awesome podcast. Um, I really appreciate you as a friend and as a member of our, our key group and um, super excited to hang out with you more. We'll have to figure out which events we're going to be at next. And um, everyone, um, have a, a great week as well. Great start to the year. And um, we'll see you then. Thanks for having me, Andrew. I really appreciate it.